think Toronto is a unique place to be doing healing work in yes. 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, this is a social experiment. Toronto is a social experiment and it's by no means, uh, you know, a perfect mm, microcosm of a global village or, but it is, in my experience as a traveler, one of the better models we have in the world. I, um, I, I really, the, the consciousness now is, is a, uh, that we all, we're all in this together, no matter where you've grown up, no mm -hmm. matter it's, it's, we have to figure out how to be with each other. And I think Toronto is a really good place to be doing healing work at this moment of history. A, we have the luxury of not having physical wars here at this moment. And B, there is a consciousness in the city. I mm -hmm. think if you're tuning in, there is an openness to, to, to kind of stepping into the new. So I feel lucky to be here at this moment. One of the most important aspects of healing is tending to our emotional wounds. We have all been hurt. It might look different from one person to another, but some of our wounds are deep and carry a specific age. When we are trying to work on our wholeness, we may need to pay attention to our inner child or our inner teen. Bringing back the lost parts of ourselves and integrating into maturity is the essence of self-development. Welcome to the Soul Space Podcast. We are your hosts, Adrian and Thal. On this episode, we have a conversation with Avi Zuraviv, a Toronto-based psychotherapist and educator. Avi is a member of the Canadian Humanistic and Transpersonal Association and an LGBTQI positive practitioner. Avi's holistic approach to psychotherapy is informed by decades of deep inner work and spiritual exploration. In this conversation, we discuss the role of psychotherapy in modern society, and we do a deep dive into the inner teen, which is a concept that hasn't received much attention in mainstream psychology. Avi shows us how our deepest wounds can often end up becoming our biggest doorways to personal transformation. It is our pleasure to bring you Avi Zuraviv. Hello, Avi. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Um, we wanted to start today with uh, your personal journey. Um, you have been a psychotherapist now for a few years. Um, please let us know how did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the Coles notes. All right. <laughs> um, never thought I would be a therapist, never set out to be a therapist. Um, I had a sort of an early awakening mm -hmm. when I was a teenager, sort of um, grew up in the suburbs of Toronto and up in York region and uh, white picket fence sort of life. Um, not really religious, mm -hmm. um, very much consumer. And, uh, I started to find myself wanting more, uh, probably around 12 or 13, starting to think about things that, um, mystery, the mystery of life, but I didn't really have any, uh, one to bounce anything off of. Um, and, um, I had an, I have an aunt and uncle who are kind of at the time were sort of the black sheep of the family. And they, uh, asked me up to their cottage up in, uh, Bancroft, Ontario, and, uh, spent 10 day, 10 days there. And I felt like I found my tribe. Mm. I remember thinking that when I was teenager like oh these are my people so how were how are they different from the rest of your family how are they black sheeps uh they were they just didn't drink the kool-aid of you know what is uh what the program of life is supposed to be they were travelers they were um 
uh, spent a lot of time in Asia. They owned, um, they owned a, uh, an Indian clothing store on Queen West and, um, um, meditated and, uh, were vegetarians and just things that were off the beaten track. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I, I intuitively felt that I'd found people I could talk to about things that I'd been really hungry to talk about. And um, that was kind of where it all started. That's awesome because those questions that you have at that young age, a lot of people do have those questions and don't know where to go. And sometimes that causes um, more anxiety. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it can. Yeah. 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 It, it's very easy to get isolated. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I felt really lucky, but then I had to come back to my suburban life and the contrast made things even more painful. Mm. Um, so I became kind of a rebellious teenager and, uh, just was counting the minutes till high school was finished so I could go traveling, which is something I really wanted to do. And that's exactly what I did. I, I, the minute high school ended, <laughs> I, don't even, I, uh, I set off and lived in Asia for a year and, um, found myself in India for six months, um, on a spiritual pilgrimage, um, and, um, meditated my brains out, mm-hmm. uh, lived in South India, uh, different ashrams, the Aurobindo ashram, uh, Ramana Maharishi ashram. And I, I went pretty deep with my meditation practices. Um, but when I got back to Toronto, uh, I realized I wasn't really in my body. Mm. I I was very much opening a lot of doorways, but I, I was kind of, my energy was going up and I, I sort of left body behind. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's how I, uh, I just, my, my instinct was to just meditate more. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And that just seemed to perpetuate this kind of feeling of ungroundedness and this feeling of kind of not wanting to be in the world, just mm-hmm. wanting to meditate back to whatever source was, is. And uh, then I started getting panic attacks in my early 20s, which was the invitation to psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. How old were you when you were in India? 18. 18, right. And it's usually at that age um, and, you know, you going after uh, the spiritual path without the embodied part is what may have caused um, you wanting to um, escape escape your body. Absolutely. And and so you, psychotherapy helps you integrate body and Yeah, I came very reluctantly. I, I didn't, I didn't really believe that psychotherapy was a valuable tool because of the sort of focus on content, on story, on, on narrative, on history. I, I sort of, from a, from a young sort of, uh, this not in, not integrated spiritual lens, that was just ego, um, indulging itself. And that wasn't, um, that was just kind of getting caught in the web of, of, you know, at the time what I called Maya or illusion. And, um, so I, I really didn't come in, in an open hearted voluntary. I came in really cause these panic attacks were getting worse mm. so much. So I would have them on the street mm. and feel like I would, um, just couldn't interact socially. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really came to just, I wanted someone to help me get rid of these panic attacks. And, um, I gave myself a year to get fixed and get back to my spiritual practice so I could go and become enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, what is it now? 20 something years later. <laughs> um, uh, for me, psychotherapy was an, a doorway into an integrated spirituality. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have to leave my spirituality behind. What I did have to leave behind was an idea of spirituality, though, that was um, really about not being here in the world, mm-hmm. which, as we are, the, the sort of, you know, any, any, in my opinion, any good spirituality is one that is of the earth and is in life. We're here, we're alive, we're in this body, 
And so why not be here? Exactly. That's very important to remember because even the wor word spirituality, a lot of people find it uh, problematic or don't understand it and uh, assume that it's about escaping when in reality, yeah. um, all the authentic spiritual teachings are about being in the world and enacting your humanity in the world. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it sounded like, um, you had your panic attacks. And so it was when things were so bad that forced you to, okay, now try, try new things and mm -hmm. psychotherapy, you went into it somewhat skeptical. It sounded like you, you know, you didn't really fully buy into the idea of it. Um, you even set a deadline in a year, you want to be fixed and then you can just continue on with your yeah. meditation. What changed? So what, at what moment did it start to shift for you when you realized, okay, this is not what I thought it was. And what was it? What, what did it become for you? I worked with a really interesting therapist, uh, who was very much all about the here and now. And I thought, oh great, the present moment, there's nothing like the present moment. This is a spiritual approach. Yet I didn't, I didn't have a sense of how much I didn't want to be in the moment emotionally and, um, vulnerably that I wanted to be in the moment with lofty concepts of mysticism and, um, uh, you know, uh, big picture stuff, but to be finite in the moment, to be raw, naked, emotionally naked in the moment was not only painful, but was, um, opened the door to my, all my, you know, deep wounds and all my, and so I, I, this therapist was really challenging, did not, did not really like it did not, not so much like, but really challenged me to stay in the moment with him. And, um, that's not an easy thing when you don't have, uh, when you haven't been, when you've not steeped in that and when that isn't the way you've been brought up. Absolutely. And this is the, um, I guess, psychological arm of this uh, spiritual path. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, seek spirituality uh, as a way to bypass uh, psychological trauma, um, yes. you know, developmental trauma, whatever. <laughs> yes. The pain of being a human. And, um, and psycho it's, it sounds like um, psychotherapy in your life um, was a tool to bring you back into your body. It was, but you know, it's interesting when I first started spiritual practices at a really young age, yoga, vegetarianism, um, I was amazed at how much clearing happened. And I think mm -hmm. it's a very common experience for a lot of people that, uh, don't, that have just kind of, it's a great starting point, spiritual practices. And it really does have a way of, a lot of these practices have a way of clearing energy mm -hmm. and opening energy and expanding energy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in the moment it, you can be a little bliss bunny because you go from living a humdrum mundane life to all of a sudden having visions or feeling waves of energy. I, everyone has a different thing, but it, it's a very, um, intoxicating and beautiful, um, uh, doorway possibly for a lot of people. And it, I think, I think psychotherapy is just, uh, it's the downward movement. So if you think mm -hmm. about spirituality as an upward movement, this is just the, the integration of, so you could say cosmos and, and, you know, um, the mundane and the, um, the transcendent and the imminent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So since Thal and I are both training to be therapists, we are, you know, commonly asked, like, what is the difference between psychotherapy and seeing a psychologist or psychiatrist? There's all these kind of terminologies and yeah. credentials. Maybe this is a good chance for us to help kind of differentiate a little bit some of the differences and why you might seek one over the other. Sure, sure. Um, you know, uh, psychotherapy up until the last few years has not been regulated in Ontario. So anybody could call themselves a psychotherapist and the focus of psychotherapists, um, is psychotherapy is counseling is, um, interventions around, um, um, looking at people's, um, struggle, all of our struggle, the, the human struggle that we're all in, but then our own personal struggles in our lives. And essentially what's, what gets in our way. That's the, that's the core of everything is what's, what gets in our way of, 
what, who we know we already are and how we want to live. And, uh, the work of a psychotherapist is to help a client, um, open to that, explore that and help the client, um, get out of their way if they want to. Um, and so that's, it's soul work. It's the work of it's, it's deep soul work. Now, this is my lens of psychotherapy. Now there's a lot of different types of psychotherapies. There's, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is more practical and, um, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, which is more interpretive, but the kind of psychotherapy that I've been trained in, and that has been my healing path is more a relational psychotherapy. It's more psychodynamic, more, um, more, um, opening to the mystery of self Mm -hmm. and without trying to fix or solve, but really taking the invitation to, to go deeper into the mystery. So that's my unique experience and sort of how I look at psychotherapy. Um, now psychotherapy is now regulated in Ontario as of the last few years, um, through the, through, there's a college of psychotherapists, um, CRPO. And, um, uh, so to be, to call yourself psychotherapist, you have to be a registered psychotherapist. There's a whole training involved. Um, do you want to know now the sort of the distinction between, I think it'd be helpful because some yeah. people have heard of, okay, a, a, a psychiatrist and maybe they are also don't know, is that psychotherapy mm-hmm. right. or, or, a, or a psychologist, you know, even looking at like in a very practical sense, like uh, insurance coverage, they might see, oh, I'm covered for all these things, but what's the difference? They all start with a P and I don't yes. know, you yes. know, they all have psyche in it. They seem to be related seem, to the mind, exactly, yeah. you know, yeah. part, because I know, I, I'm sure there are lots of overlaps, but for a consumer who's mm-hmm. new and, and is searching might be helpful to provide some guidance. Uh, psychologists are, uh, uh, it's a doctoral program uh, and they're trained. The specialty with a psychologist is diagnosis. The, they're, they're very much trained around um, diagnosing mental health issues, mental health conditions, and they're legally allowed to diagnose. Psychotherapists uh, can assess, we can't diagnose, but we can treat, um, whereas psychologists can diagnose and treat. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, there are a lot of psychologists that do psychotherapy in the sense of counseling and having, um, you know, these kinds of conversations with people. Um, the focus is, is for many psychologists is on diagnosis and, um, that, that's sort of their specialty area. Whereas a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who is trained, um, in their specialty is prescri- prescribing medication and, um, uh, now, you know, um, psychiatrists can do psychotherapy and psychologists can do psychotherapy, but psychotherapists can't diagnose like a psychologist can and psychotherapists can't prescribe like a psychiatrist can. So okay. does that kind of clear up a little bit of the... I think that's a great distinction. Yeah. yeah. Just um, having a sense of even the scope of what they're trained to do and, and what they offer. Actually, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a second year student, a PhD in transpersonal psychology. So, um, I definitely cannot prescribe <laughs> or, um, right. uh, you know, diagnose even because it's, um, it's not clinical, uh, psychology. Right. Um, it's more, it's, I would say it's, it's closer to the psychotherapeutic, um, arm of, of mental health. Okay. Um, um, but a lot of people do also ask, what does transpersonal mean? Um, from your description of psychotherapy, that's, that's the transpersonal. That's the, uh, yeah. the, the, the space beyond the ego. And, um, and, and, and through my program, um, we're able to sort of connect that with empirical research and, um, sort of we look into, um, how the brain functions during meditation and wow. altered states and all that. So, um, and that's all the realm of, of within the realm of mental health. Absolutely. And the word transpersonal is misinterpreted yeah. heavily because the, the word itself trans beyond personal, beyond the self. Yes. The, the sort of, you know, there is an aspect to us that is bigger than ourself, but it doesn't mean we don't get to take the self with us. Yes. It doesn't mean the self sort of dissolves into nothingness and the spirit comes through and, um, you know, is running the show without any, I, I like to, the, the sort of adage that I really like when it comes to 
helping people understand what is transpersonal psych psychotherapy and what is just the transpersonal itself is, you know, do you guys know the saying, it's not the, uh, you know, that whole idea of spirituality being like a, we're like all like drops mm -hmm. that drop into the ocean and mm -hmm. sort of the ocean is the bigger, consciousness? Spirit, bigger consciousness, yeah. bigger, whatever your name for that yes. is, whether it's God or goddess or whatever your thing. So I, I like to, when I, when I'm trying to explain what is transpersonal, I really like to say it's not the drop that slips into the ocean, but it's the ocean that slips into the drop. Amazing. Yeah. And that to me is what an embodied spirituality is. You don't actually get to dissolve yourself, but you do get to take yourself along with for the bigger ride that is bigger than your, it's, it is bigger than your, what, what do I want? What do I fear? It's, it's bigger than your wounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a place that's bigger than our wounds. Truly. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to get to that place, we have to understand our wounds and confront them. And <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That is the price. So on that note, we, since we brought up, um, you, you bring up a, a few things that are, I think are really important to highlight just, so your approach to therapy as embracing the mystery of self, right? So really it's a journey of getting to know parts of yourself that maybe you have either forgotten or didn't place much attention and the wounded parts being probably a key part to actually focus on in the therapeutic relationship. Yes. Um, can you maybe, uh, share with us what, what that's like um, for people that might not have experienced therapy. What is that, that process like and how might these old wounds show up in people's current lives and how they experience the world? Do you mean how therapists work with wounds or how I would work with a wound as a therapist? Maybe give an example for how it would show up for a person that might not be aware that these old wounds are affecting their experience of the world see. and that the way they interact with other people, because it perhaps is, it's not conscious yet. I see. I see. Um, well, wounds are a tricky business because to be alive is to be wounded. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we're, our, our true nature is vast and spacious and, uh, and, and wants to, um, merge with everything. This is kind of like the true spiritual identity of, of who we all are. And so, and then we're all tossed into this existence where you have a body and you're called Adrian and you're going, you know, we all have different names and you have a, you know, we have separate bodies and separate, uh, experiences and we're sort of, tossed to figure it out on our own. So that in itself creates an existential crisis that is just called life, right? This vast expanse of spirit trying to reconcile living in a finite, um, singular experience. Uh, it's uh, William Blake, uh, or, or one of my favorite, a uh, really great poet, uh, you know, he says eternity, which he's saying like life source, Eternity is in love with mm -hmm. time and space, but to become, to go into the time and space, it has to be dismembered. It has to be broken. That pure, vast spirit has to be, it's like a shard of broken glass that you call it, that we're all calling our separate selves. So, it, you know, um, just to breathe and to take up space in a way is to be wounded. <laughs> There's a, a book called uh, the trauma of, um, the, I think it's called the trauma of birth and it's essentially not, not birth trauma, but it's just traumatic to be born in, in a, in a, in an existential sense. Mm -hmm. It's the price of admission. It's the price of admission. So it's, it's a, it's a, rec it's a negotiation and, um, you, you don't have to have had a terrible childhood to, uh, you could have a great childhood yeah. and you're still in those waters. Now for some people, like you said, it, some people are, um, more tuned into that level of, of their self, of their being and other people are less tuned in and that's okay. That's, there's no, I don't think, uh, you know, at some point in life, you, pe we all will struggle with this. Yes. Um, yeah. for a lot of people, it does come out around midlife. Um, it's when a lot of people start to become a little more reflective. Mm -hmm. Um, but some of us, and that's all of us in this room, actually, 
um, are just kind of have more of an orientation to um, introspection. Mm-hmm. And it's and some people want to tune in, but um, have uh, palpable wounds that maybe um, act as an obstacle. Um, and perhaps uh, that's what Adrian was trying to mm. or was hinting at. Um, maybe developmental traumas or actual traumas. I mean, we're not gonna like go into the details of that, sure. but that those also can be. Um, Obstacles or the tools, yes. If confronted, to to um, like tune in to the bigger self. Well, because their culture it doesn't give us enough tools, exactly. and there aren't enough elders in the culture to help us understand what these wounds are when they come up. The they come up through symptoms mm-hmm. is is because we don't have enough elders to. Uh, guide us they do show up but they come up through you know when I mentioned panic attacks in my case Mm -hmm. or it will be something different Um, most people come to therapy for one of two things anxiety or depression or some variation of anxiety or depression means a hyper state anxiety or a hypo state depression and most you know the way um it's like coming back to my story, just I want to get rid of this. It's just help me get rid of my wound, help me fix my wound so I can go back and become a spiritual person again. Whereas from an integrated from an integrated psychotherapy and an integrated spirituality, those symptoms are the doorways to the gods. Mm. And what I mean by that is that in in the exploration of what we're calling wounds, what we're calling our symptoms, is not just uh, pain and suffering, but is a whole ocean of of who knows what. Desire, Mm. longing, yearning, um, heartbreak, um, unmet dreams, Mm -hmm. uh, unmet potentials. um, And if you follow that, it's hard. Mm. To follow to follow that means you have to really feel it, and but if, if you can stay with it, if you can if you can follow that thread, um, entire doors that were not there will open be, will open for you, and um, um, so so at the end of the day, it's not so much okay. I fixed my wound. Now it's more. The wound is an invitation into living a fuller, richer, more embodied life and having richer connections with mm. with people. I think I think the, the the deep longing of the times is is around connection. Um, there's a, a deep isolation that we're that all of us experience, and um, the instinct is to fill it with stuff. Mm. Just name the, the substance that you you know. Just think about your life and what substance you go to to fill your need for the connection, right? And and so work. So this approach is uh, it's it's like an alternative to just trying to fill that place inside with stuff. It's actually. Um, looking at the the raw energy itself of the desire of the need and seeing what um how you live in your own skin and how do you how do you feed yourself you know spiritually um how do you care for your own being and a lot of that, that's a mystery to a lot of people how to just self-care in the sense of um inner work inner work and just being kind right. being kind to self that's a mystery from uh, self-compassion self-compassion mm-hmm. right, right? I, I think a lot of people might actually be surprised to hear this that even as adults you're walking around thinking okay i'm a full-grown adult that we are carrying with us many parts of self including our child selves right mm-hmm. especially the ones that are carrying the wounds if these wounds happen early in life um, so we are walking with all these selves all the time and I think it's a helpful language almost to even be able to name some of this stuff and start to just be 
begin to get some clarity um, in in the potentially messy experience that we're having, you know, when when someone is overwhelmed with anxiety, yes, to realize that you know maybe some of it is a longing or a crying for help, and it's coming from the inner child parts. Um, would you mind sharing with us what that might look like in a therapeutic setting where people are working with their their inner child, or sure, or, or the term you know we often hear is reparenting. You know, when we're learning to reparent these these but wounds. Something that you said just now. Um, Sort of just, I just want to come back for a second to the cult, to our culture itself. Yes, yeah, modernity. And what's that? <laughs> modernity. Modernity. And in modernity, Krishnamurti, a modern philosopher from India, said, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Mm. And the reason I want to come back to that is um, there are people that are just more sensitive. By nature. Mm. And those are the people that often end up in therapy younger. <laughs> That's all of you, all of us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to be sensitive in a world that is on fire on, mm. in so many ways is a very challenging thing mm. to be really awake in these times of environmental catastrophe and, um, uh, crisis of meaning it, it's to really look at that to really be open it's it's not an easy time to be an awake person and to be a sensitive person and so um i just want to say this because just to give people listening uh a compass here mm, actually if you're if you're feeling wounded and you're probably more healthy <laughs> in some ways and I, i'm being a little facetious but what i mean by that is um it's okay to, it's okay to, um, feel it's okay to, um, um, you know, struggle. It's, okay. it's actually a sign that you're alive mm -hmm. when you struggle. I think that's so important to highlight. I mean, in a, in a culture that is, I think celebrates intellect and being able to rise into the cognitive parts of being that we lose sense of like you're just talking about the sensitivity yeah. uh, through the body through our emotions and although it's painful it might actually be a sign that you're waking up that you're beginning and that you're and that you're part of you is listening to what's happening around you that you're alive <laughs> yes that you're alive <laughs> and reacting to to what you know congratulations uh, you're not a robot <laughs> you're not a robot you're not a robot there's su there's such a fear right now of being impacted right of of impacting each other mm. that that how what you do and what you say and how you, God forbid that should impact me or God forbid what I do or say should impact you. It's like we've come to a point now where it's like it's that absurd, right? Where we're afraid of impacting each other, where that is the whole point we're here. That's the whole reason of being alive is that's the other word to say that is relationship. Mm. I impact you and you impact me. That's the, the nature of relationship. And so... um coming back to being wounded, um, you know, using that as an invitation to what's happening around you, what's happening inside of you and all of your relationships in and out. And so, yes, we have Adrian about your question. We have relationship with parts of ourself that are, uh, at different stages developmentally, including a younger, more, um, uh, younger aspects of, of our own history, of our own self that live in us. And we are in relationship with them, uh, whether it's our infant part of our nature, preverbal part of our nature, um, the, the sort of more adolescent aspect. We, we do have relationship with aspects of self. And I don't mean that in a sort of defined sort of compartmentalized way. I mean it in the sense of who we are as a tapestry. Yes. Just like life. And so we're, re we're relating to different aspects of ourselves all the time, unconsciously, mostly. It is the complexity of being a human. Um, we are not 2D. <laughs> no. Like, you know, there, there are so many layers um, to um, our existence. Um, and Speaking of that, we'd like to um, go into the um, inner teen. That's a term that yes. we've heard you mention before. And um, what, what what does that mean? And um, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and how is it different from the child? Exactly. Because yeah. there yes. clearly are differences when we enter teenage years and, and how it affects us psychologically. So just coming back to what we were talking about is the collage of, of our inner self. There's different parts. Um, we're mostly um, encouraged to walk around with what we call an adult, right? If we are an adult, assuming yes. we are, I, I mean, <laughs> assuming chronologically we're in, in that part of our life. Uh, and um, that, that could be different things too. But the idea is to be, you know, the adult part of us is autonomous um, can make decisions for ourselves and is um, in negotiation with life, with prioritizing what's important. And it's, it's kind of, you can think about it as a muscle mm. in your, in your mind that uh, is discerning and that knows how to respond to situations and people. And, and, and there isn't, I just want to say when we're, cause it's very easy to fall into, um, perfection. Mm. We're not talking, I'm not talking about, uh, any kind of utopic idealized sense. It's just, you could say the part of you that the part of us that knows how to navigate our life and knows how to, um, uh, I don't know what the, what the word I'm looking for is, but knows how to, I'm thinking maybe like these are like bringing up these terms are just tools for us, like you said, to help us navigate our lives. Um, and uh, it, it's not an end goal. And it's not when we talk about the inner teen it does not mean, OK, that means I have to grow into the adult. Yes, <laughs> it's yes. these are just tools for us to navigate our our growth, our path in life. Yeah. It's a lens. It's a lens. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a lens to look at. And so this lens of adult is this lens of who we think we are mostly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then what do we do with the parts of us that come up that are more at a different developmental stage, mm -hmm. um, the teen, the child. And so what is the teen? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting because there isn't a lot of, we don't often talk about our inner teen. You hear in popular psychology and books, the inner child is like, there's hundreds, if not thousands of books written on the inner child and how to work with the inner child. And that's, that's an easy concept for most people. Yeah. You, know, you gotta, you have a young kid living inside of you. The kid feels things that kids feel. <laughs> Just name them. If the kid is, if the kid is a happy kid, the kid feels spontaneous and joyous and uh, wants to play. And if the kid is not happy, the kid feels ashamed. Um, the kid feels um, maybe self-loathing, uh, whatever, whatever it is. But it's a very easy concept to grasp. And most people can go, oh, yeah, yeah, there's part of me that feels very young and shy and all these things. But when it comes to the inner teen, we're getting into the weeds because what happens when we actually move in our actual lives, when we move from being children to being adolescents, there's a radical change happening in our bodies and in our minds. And it's a time where so much energy has to be mobilized to make that transition from childhood to adulthood. It's, it's a liminal intermediary time. And so, the sort of life force has to really mobilize because if, if biologically, if we can't do this, we, we really don't grow up psychologically. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tremendous energy that comes through and being an adolescent. And, um, we don't, again, coming back to the culture, we don't have a lot of guides for, um, for adolescents, um, you know, there's, there's just such a lack of, of mentorship around what all these changes are. And so we're, we, we're often taught to shut it down mm. and anything you shut down goes on the back burner and then it will show up later. And so a lot of us adults are walking around with a very activated inner teen. And this inner teen is different than the inner child is not so much about the child kind of just wants to be nurtured in a very 
uh, base, in, in, at an elemental level, children need gathering support to be seen, to be acknowledged. It's it's very much about dependence needs from a childhood developmental level. An adolescent has a very different developmental uh, need. Uh, it's it's a time where you don't want to be coddled and 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 sort of held in that same way. It's actually a time of. But it's actually not a time where you want to be left to do your own thing either. It's a in that liminal time is a it's a time of um, rebellion, a, rebellion. But in the even in the rebellion, you want to be there. There's an energy that teenagers. If, I don't know if anyone has teenagers in their life here. They want to be met often, even even in their rebellion. My son is a preteen, so this helps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, the, especially boys, a lot of a lot of boys uh, with their mothers, relationship with their mothers. It's really a time that the psychological umbilical cord is cut. Mm. And so on the one side, get away from me, mom. Yes. But on the other side, on the other side, it's like, See don't, me, love me. don't leave me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There need, there want, there's a it's, it's helpful for when the teenager knows there's a, a place to come back to to check in. So it's a interdependent time not a time of independence mm. and not a time of dependence it's an interdependent time it's a very tricky dance and again because the culture is very young in the sense of what to do with these energies um for many of us we just bury the teen at the time when it's happening mm. um uh, or spin out you can bury the bury the energy or you can spin out and act it out so it's that more stereotypical rebellious teenager that tells everyone to f off, and you know it's it's. But even that is doesn't fulfill the deeper need there, which is, um, what do I? What the hell do I do with all of this life force channeling through me? There's an, an, a sexuality that's being awakened. There's um, you know there's a, an identity that's being shed, but an, a, a, the new identity hasn't been formed yet. So many, so many things happening. Um, and so fast forward later in your life, what it, we all have an inner teen. What, what I find uh, for people that I was a very rebellious teenager and just did what I wanted and didn't really care and took, it's a time of risk taking. I took a lot of risks as a teenager. Luck. I had a lot of luck, so I didn't get into as much trouble as I could have. And not everyone's that lucky. But, you know, I find that people that have been more on the on the yang side of risk taking and acting out later in their life, like I'm in my 40s now. And what I've been confronting over the last few years is an inner teen that is more quiet and shy and that is a really unfamiliar territory for me because I was the exact opposite. So it's kind of as when I tune into my teen, he's often really shy. And and I find working with people who have had the opposite experience, kind of people that say, oh, my teenage years were fine. It didn't really have any, you know, I was kind of just an obedient, quiet, good Good girl, good boy. Yeah, you're describing me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm the reverse now. <laughs> yeah, people. Well, people like you are fascinating because then they come to therapy and it's like all this, all these jars just yep. start opening, mm -hmm. and then all the all the unmet, you know, all that, like, unmet all that unmet life, life force. force, right? And it's like, what do I do with it? <laughs> so it's good to create a, a podcast. With yes, <laughs> helping me a lot, Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> I mean, even tuning into the energy of the conversation, I feel like this, you mentioned the mobilization of energy. I'm feeling it as we're speaking. Mm -hmm. it, the teens are in the room now, you know, they're, they're mobilized, but I'm also getting kind of, um, picking up on the importance of grounding that energy. And that sounds to be the key to this work is to find a way to, to work with that energy, not yes. to diminish it, not to waste it. Yeah. The, the trick is grounding without shutting down. Because there's a lot of talk about grounding, and grounding is great, but you have to. We just have to be careful when it comes to the, the teen. Doesn't want it, it will, it might, that energy does not necessarily want to ground. Uh, this is why working with uh, our inner teen is not so simple. You can. Uh, the nature of therapy is containment. Mm -hmm. You come in, you sit down, you have a conversation. Uh, teenagers are future thinking. They don't want to talk about 
what happened when they were five or what or what happened even when they were they few it, it it's it's a it's a drive it's visionary it's a visionary energy therapy can feel like another suffocating place for an inner teen so yes that energy that you're tuning into definitely needs grounding but it has to be a very clever kind of grounding otherwise it can be instructive and it can come across as just someone telling me what to do mm. <laughs> which is the last thing a teen wants to hear <laughs> so how to how to sort of you know trick somebody into grounding themselves and it's uh it, it's like i love working with people's inner teen mm. because i know that place really well in myself and it's not doesn't freak me out at all. I actually find it really energizing and um, very, it's like the work is very, as a therapist, I'm learning a lot because I often get pushback. Like, you know, no, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Or, oh God, I'm so sick of this. Or, oh God, you know, another therapy. I don't, I'm sick of talking about my mom and dad. Great. Because for me, I have to throw out the book of what I think I'm doing and I have to create a new therapy for this person by following them. And so yes, grounding, but on the teens terms, mm. that's where it gets complicated and tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the word sometimes I hear people use is transmute. So we're maybe perhaps working with that energy. So by grounding it in, in where they feel like you're trying to control them, it's probably you know, squashing it and we're squandering this opportunity. Um, the visionary energy, it almost sounds, it can be very productive. This can actually, you know, it might be destructive as it's um, appearing in their life, but perhaps with the right guidance, it can actually be turned into a very productive um, transformation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think so. And um, it's only, as, we're, as we just are seeing in the culture right now, it's only young people that are going to be the leaders uh, to, to face the evolutionary crisis that we're in right now, the environmental crisis and the crisis of meaning. It's, it's really young people that are going to pave the way forward. And we just saw it um, at, in the United States with the midterm elections that just happened, all these incredibly young people being elected um, that are visionaries and are not afraid to put up bold ideas that, that are, necessary if we're going to meet the, the, the sort of struggle of the time. And so it's really, we need this energy. We need the energy. And yet the, we have to figure out how to help people, actual real teenagers, uh, <laughs> yes. how to hold that energy. Yeah, yeah. Cause the life force in us is not, it's actually transpersonal in the sense that it comes through us yeah it's too big to hold yeah. it's and when that kind of awakening starts to happen in people it's scary it is and when you say the word grounding i remember that word i like in, when i first started my own um therapy i was so annoyed with that word i was like i've, I've been in the ground like I, I'm, I'm done with being like you know yeah. so um so even that word like what does it mean to ground and to yes. yeah I, I, for me what it means is to help somebody um figure out how to be in what's what they're inside of without shutting down or spinning out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that that's tricky and maybe channeling is a better word than grounding i don't know mm -hmm. but um working with Work, working with the life with force, the energy with the energy yes yeah. yeah i mean sometimes grounding could be a matter of just speaking the truth mm -hmm. i don't know if you've had the experience of um feeling um you know, feeling sort of incredibly um, um, grounded after you've spoken the truth. Yes. Like, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. It, it's actually part of my journey to, um, uh, you know, express and, and heal that the parts that have been silenced or, or repressed um, at a younger age. Yeah. 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 There's a, a for anyone that wants some reading on the inner teen, there is one good book. There, is, there aren't many books on the inner teen, but uh, there's a book called Brainstorm mm -hmm. by, I believe it's Daniel Siegel. Oh, yeah, I want to say Siegel. Daniel Siegel, S I E G E L. And, but the book is called Brainstorm, and it's all about the 
inner teen, but also it's written for teenagers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's one of the better books on what this whole wild phase is or, or transitional phase is all about. And it's a very practical book. Mm -hmm. So it would be a good one for, yeah, for your son. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to look into it. Um, I also want to bring up, um, age and also the word that's coming up for me is, is shame. Like that people might feel like, wait, I'm an inner teen inside and like, and mm-hmm. feel shame. There's that. And then there's age where, yeah, well, there is biological age. There is psychological age, emotional yes. age, yes, perhaps even spiritual age. Sure. So yeah, these are things to put into perspective and think about. If the energy of shame is coming up, mm-hmm around the inner teen, that's a really good clue that yeah. shame has happened. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? so, so it's not a coincidence. Right. If, if you're listening to this, you know, mm-hmm. podcast and when you imagine inner teen, you're going, uh, or yes. what, that's a clue for you as to <laughs> probably something in your own psyche. It's, it's really more about, you know, so that would be a, that would be an invitation for somebody who does feel shame. Um, because not everybody does get shamed uh, mm-hmm. at this time of their life. Mm. Um, so, and to be okay with it and work with it and self-compassion. Yeah. Well, shame, shame has two faces, right? There's the healthy aspect of shame, which is uh, a teenager needs to learn. They are limit. They're, they're finite. There, mm-hmm. there is limits to what you can do with time and energy. And, and you can't just, you want to go future, but you can't conquer the world. And in, in, you know, you have, there is, there are limits to what you can physically do. And that's healthy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of good to know. Okay. And if I, you know, um, just go and do what I want, it will have, it might have negative impact and I need to know what my impact is. So shame has, has a good side, but where a lot of us have been, mentored in is the toxic side of shame where it's about an identity shame becomes an identity and it's not about teaching limits but it's about your the the whole sense of you're wrong you're wrong for feeling what you're feeling you're wrong for doing that thinking that and if we if we if we live in a family unit where the emotions the, the the life force is not allowed to flow and, the, and, and our parents didn't know how to ground and channel that energy in themselves. And all of a sudden it's coming up in us. We will be shamed on some level. Mm-hmm. And shame doesn't have to look like scolding. It can look like just being just a ignored. feeling in the body too. Yeah. Feeling in the body, but just being ignored yeah. or being, you know, that could, that deeply, that can be deeply shaming. Yes, that's true. So, um, so shame, shame is when shame turns into an identity, uh, that's the work then to work with shame. And, uh, from my own personal experience, experience and experiences of like friends around me, um, that shame actually causes a lot of stuckness in life. And, yeah. and, you know, that question of what's wrong with me, why am I like this? Yes. It becomes a, a loop, um, in the mind. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah. all I think about is more compassion, more forgiveness towards self. You know, the first step with shame is it's not necessarily compassion because they're, they're just with shame. There isn't compassion. The Mm. nature of shame is, is almost it's self punitive, right? It's the first nature, the first sort of thing to do with shame is to externalize it, to speak it, to witness, to have someone witness because shame lives in hiding places. Mm. It's that thing of I'm defective. Something is wrong with me. And I have to keep that a secret. No one can know that I'm flawed. So I need to, I need to hide. I need to shut down. And when you start speaking it, like I feel unworthy, Mm. that is the first step in Mm -hmm. the direction of healing shame. And, um, later it's really about going into the feelings around it Mm -hmm. and doing the deep feeling work. Um, but you know, it, it, to, to just come, it, the self-compassion will come later. Yes. With shame. I was skipping ahead. <laughs> well, it, I mean, and that's the thing is, you know, oftentimes people will get shamed 
in about being ashamed <laughs> and why, why are you so hard on yourself you're such a sweet sweet person what, come on you know I actually heard that many times right? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. just be nice to yourself yeah. and if it was that easy we would all do it and it's um it often isn't helpful mm. to to um to just um to let someone know that you know they should be different mm-hmm. so yeah i think that's so important just you talked about um like we need the courage. We need the courage to begin sharing, you know, and, and the healing that begins when you start to allow these inner things to come out into the open. I mean, just personally, this this project of doing this podcast has been incredibly challenging because our own shit's coming up all the time. We are stepping into a new territory. Absolutely. We're being exposed, feeling more naked than ever. And so, yes, like we are seeing it firsthand. You know, our own stuff is mixed in with this creative project. And so... Um, we're not just talking about it, you know, as some sort of a theoretical no, thing. No. It's, it's live. It's I can feel it through the whole. I can feel sort of an energy as we're trudging along that is a little bit multi-layered and has different aspects and feels strange at moments and inspire it. There is a real energy here. So you guys are cooking whatever it is that you're doing. You're in. You're really in something here. And what I love uh, is that you've decided to not be perfect in it and not try to get it right it's like let it be messy that's <laughs> that's great forget your perfect offering have you heard that it's a the, uh-huh. that leonard cohen song yes oh, forget yes. your perfect offering and the next line is there's a crack a crack in everything mm. that's how the light gets in it's it's your humanity that will probably make this um unique mm-hmm and you know, and I just want to also highlight that um, this is a universal human experience. Um, I was brought up in a different culture um, that's a little bit more uh, collectivist, not in, mm-hmm. and um, a lot of the, you know my individuality or individuality in general is usually squashed. And um, but then half of my more than half of my life I've been living here in Canada, and I'm noticing that wait. <laughs> Even here, the same problems. It's literally exactly the same problems that I've encountered as a teenager in the Middle East. Mm. People encounter here. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I personally, for me, I just don't see um, the difference. Obviously, context is different. But yeah. the, the essence of our human experience, our human pain, our wounds, shame, guilt, all those things are similar. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think Toronto is a unique place to be doing healing work in yes. 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are, this is the social experiment. Toronto is a social experiment and it's by no means, uh, you know, a perfect mm, microcosm of a global village or, but it is in my experience as a traveler, one of the better models we have in the world. I, I, um, I, I really, the, the consciousness now is, is a, uh, that we all, we're all in this together, no matter where you've grown up, no mm-hmm. matter it's, it's, we have to figure out how to be with each other. And I think Toronto is a really good place to be doing healing work at this moment of history. A, we have the luxury of not having physical wars here at this moment. And B, there is a consciousness in the city. I mm-hmm. think if you're tuning in. There is an openness to 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 kind of stepping into the new, so I feel lucky to be here at this moment. Yeah, we 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 just had a conversation a few days ago with with Andrew Harvey, and he talked about we're going through a birthing experience collectively, and it's a birthing of a new human that he was sort of mm-hmm. referring to, and it's we don't know what it's going to be. That's the part of the surprise, the mystery, and we've been going through this, you know, on this planet time and time again you know there was a period where most species were underwater and we were a bunch of fish swimming around and at some point that the water got so polluted that some fish had to take the risk to go into the unknown mm-hmm. and some of them ended up on the shore on the sizzling so shore in air mm-hmm. without the proper you know um, gear to to survive and yet some of them did and that created the new birthing of an evolutionary transition. And it's such a beautiful metaphor because I feel like this is kind of what we're referring to right now, you know, with this collective 
uh, yearning for meaning and people trying new things and pushing the boundary that we're about to see an emergence of perhaps many versions of, of new human being or new ways of being. No matter what you feel about the times right now, whether you're more cynical, we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket type person or <laughs> or more the, oh, you know, we can we can save our planet type person, wherever you fall in that mm. spectrum. And we're all on that spectrum somewhere and it might change every day for you. Um, th these are fascinating times to be alive. Forget about what might happen. Absolutely. These are I feel that. Yes. It is. <laughs> Just from a pure, wow, we get to be alive in this. What are we in? It's like, what? what is this chaos that we're in? Yes. It's interesting. Absolutely. There's never a dull moment. <laughs> it's not dull. It's not dull. Sometimes we, 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 I think we, a lot of us sometimes wish for the volume to get turned down just a little bit, mm. um, especially in the last few years with uh, on so many levels but i th i think coming back to what andrew harvey was saying uh, the volume's not going down the, if anything the volume is going up mm. and um we're gonna have to find ways and this connects to the inner teen we're gonna have to find ways to stay present with each other and with the crisis that we're in uh, evolutionary crisis that we're in um, we're going to have to find ways to clever ways to stay present because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's just too easy to dissociate. Right That's now. true. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and men mental health is, is at the forefront because of those reasons. And we're learning now that mental health is just not just the brain or just the cognitive mm -hmm. side of things. And, and, and that there is more to mental health, um, than just, um, ju than just that. Yeah. Mm hmm. I agree. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to find a new model of mental health, I think, too. Yeah. That goes beyond. Everybody should go to therapy. <laughs> That's what whatever. <laughs> no, whatever your therapy is. Yeah, therapy, therapy. I just and I want to say therapy, psychotherapy is a what is a method. Yes. And honestly, it's a, it's worked for me and I it's what I do with my life. It's you guys are all here because it's working or has worked in some way. For, if somebody comes in and it's just, you know, for people listening, you try it out. If it's not your bliss, if it's not your path, find another method. There's really, uh, there's, there's so many other ways in. Um, what I, what I really do like about therapy, a, a good integrative therapy is um, non-prescriptive. And mm. so it's, it's the hunger of the times uh, to, to not be so regimented and not be so, okay, Yes. I just need to improve One myself. One solution oriented, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's important because I've like, again, I've also had people, um, come and ask me, oh, well, so, so then what we all need therapy. <laughs> and that's why I made that joke. It's, um, yeah, yeah therapy is just a tool in words. Like you said, yeah. there are many different tools. And if it means that, you seek a therapist for for a little bit in your life then so be it and if i don't know you decide to start dancing then so be it <laughs> i think yeah you're speaking of therapy as not so much like a session but just yes. you know therapy in the sense of of the true meaning of therapy which is the word therapy comes from a greek word tartarus mm. and tartarus is the underworld in, mm -hmm. in the greek uh, mythological lens and the underworld is where you go to um, find yourself in a deeper way and it's where you go under your mm -hmm. body under down mm -hmm. and so yeah we all need therapy in that sense of um, tuning in connecting to, to ourself into the larger sphere mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. yeah Abby thank you so much for your time and My happy pleasure. suffering <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you thank you Abby and may we you know conquer our fears and shame and um, whatever it is that we need to do to um, become attuned with our inner selves. Thank you, Abby, for my pleasure. Deep that conversation. Hour went really fast. <laughs>
unbeknownst to me, the limbs I carried around grew paralyzed and numb stealthily. Unbeknownst to me, the anger I inherited a tree, deciduous, re-sprouting incessantly and stealthily. When self-deception, yours and mine, intermingled inside the deep night, your tears on my tongue, our ending in your eyes, our love melded discarded stories of pain uttered in the silent cry of those tricked into false submission. Be true, my love. Be true, my soul. Even if it takes a thousand lifetimes. Be brave. hope you enjoyed this episode. Next week, we explore symbolism within stories, from religion to pop culture, with Jonathan Pajot. You can find links and show notes at soulspacepodcast.com. The best way to help us grow right now is to leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on social at soulspacepod, that's soulspacepod. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Until next time.